Photography 1, Lecture 1, Introduction and the Camera. This photograph uh, made by Joe Pugliese for The New Yorker magazine um, is of a venture capitalist in the Silicon Valley. Um, and it was photographed in an environment that gives us no um, cues as to where he's located, um, or where he was located when this image was taken. Um, it could be a uh, blank, dark wall in a, uh, an office or in, in a gentleman's home, um, but it also could have been photographed in a studio. Um, it's clear that there is one primary source of light uh, coming from the right and above, and um, camera, that's camera right as opposed to the right of the subject, um, and is either provided by a um, strobe light or um, by a, a window. Um, more than likely, it's a controlled light uh, using a softbox. Um, the, uh, the great advantage of shooting with a, a blank background like this is that attention really is focused on the, the subject. Um, in this case, his face, but also his hands. Um, his gesture, his, his way of holding himself, is very important to the emotional content of the picture. This is uh, essentially another portrait um, taken by Alex Soth, um, excuse me, Soth, I know it's supposed to rhyme, rhyme with both, um, of a, uh, a Mississippi River dweller um, for a series that he was doing on such people. And um, this is what would be referred to it as, as an environmental portrait. Um, it's very much about the place. Um, it tells us also that he has an interest in model planes, apparently. Um, this doesn't appear to have been lit in any other way than with um, natural overcast light, which um, can be terrific, especially for showing this level of detail. Um, we see the gentleman, we see him um, clothed, I guess, however he likes to clothe himself, um, but also with um, some detail in the background. It's out of focus, but it gives you a sense of what his environment is like. Now, this is a portrait of a very different sort. Um, G Judy Dater, um, California photographer, um, had Imogen Cunningham, who was um, a very well-known um, fine art photographer in California um, from the turn of the last century, um, with Twinka, um, a well-known model at, at the time. She was well-known among fine art photographers. And she contri Dater contrived to have the two meet as if for the first time, or by surprise, um, in the woods. Um, this is all very tongue-in-cheek, and um, uh, I think it has this, it has a very delightful, um, naive quality to it. This is by Lee Friedlander, um, one of the great late 20th century photographers um, from a series that he did um, called Self-Portrait. Um, Friedlander's way of working is to have a, a variety of series going at any given time so that whenever opportunities to exploit whatever series he, he's working on, um, he can dive in and, and um, take pictures that relate to the, the rest of that body of work. So that's how um, self-portrait uh, developed. Um, in the process, he would photograph himself in reflections as, as it is here, or he would set up the camera on, and put it on a tripod or on top of something else and photograph himself sitting in his room or doing whatever he was doing, um, but also uh, documenting his shadow in the landscape um, and other ways of, of portraying himself. Um, the, it, the book is now considered a landmark um, in the history of photographic books. This is by uh, Edward Steichen of uh, uh, the actress Gloria Swanson, uh, which was made for Vogue magazine. And um, here, rather than just photographing Ms. Swanson, um, as so many photographers at the time had, this is taken in 1924, um, he chose to photograph her through a veil of, of um, uh, lace. So we have this superimposition of the lace over um, Gloria Swanson's face. 
and yet the face comes through very dramatically, and the juxtaposition, I think, really works very effectively. This is a, uh, an image of uh, John Herschel, who was a scientist um, instrumental in the development of photography in its early days. Um, Julia Margaret Cameron um, was the photographer. She was friends with um, a great many um, of the elite um, in English society during the middle of the 19th century. Um, and her way of working was to have um, her friends and acquaintances dress up as various mythical and um, biblical characters. And um, she would stage them in various scenes, uh, wearing uh, garments from whatever period the, the, uh, the character came from. Um, but again, this is, uh, I'm more, as much as anything, I'd like to draw your attention to the lighting. Again, that's, that's going to be key in um, assessing any photograph. Where's the lighting, where does the light come from, and what quality does it have? Here it's relatively uh, contrasty, as it was with the, uh, the photograph of Mark Andreessen at the beginning of this series, um, and still shows um, a, a quality of the sitter um, that's unmistakable. This is an image that was taken um, a few years before the previous image, and right around the same time, um, of uh, Ari Lesec, who was a very well-known photographer at the time, and taken by Charles Negret, who was also a, a very well-known French photographer. Um, here he had um, Lesec uh, stand between two gargoyles uh, on one of the towers of um, Notre Dame with the city in the background. And I'm sure that there was uh, you know, a fair amount of humor being expressed here um, but there's also um, evidence of architecture and the city, uh, insofar as that you can actually see some of the cityscape beyond the, uh, the gargoyles. This is the first known photograph taken in 1826 by, um, uh, by Niepce, a um, French photographer. Oh, actually, it was... Yes, he became a photographer because he was the person who invented it. Um, this was taken at his farmhouse um, in the country and um, depicts uh, outbuildings in, at, at the farm. Um, he set up his camera, um, placed a, a light-sensitive plate in the back of it, and exposed it all day long. Uh, and as a result, there is sun on the... Uh, facing sides of two buildings, which in nature is clearly not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> that was a depiction of what, with enhancement, the image looks like. This is what the plate actually looks like um, to the eye. So you can see that it was a very crude, um, a very uh, ephemeral image, very difficult to read but nevertheless an image and, and the one that got the, uh, the ball rolling on photography. It's taken with a camera that looked very much like this, um, although I don't believe it had the bellows. Um, just a piece of ground glass in the front and um, some means of holding the, uh, the film in the back. As you can see here, film holders and, and the back of a, a view camera. And um, however, that all changed when um, and what I should say about all of that is that photography, um, until um, later in the 19th century, was really the province of professional photographers. And <clears throat> uh, it required considerable knowledge of the process and the equipment used um, to make even passable images. That all changed when this gentleman came along. Um, this is a photograph of um, George Eastman, who um, invented the Kodak camera. And um, that was basically this, a box, um, very much like the one that uh, Niepce used to make the first image, with a lens at one end and uh, film on the inside, um, an extremely simple um, device. The user was never to open it. Um, you would take pictures for as 
uh, as many frames as there were on the roll of film that was inside the camera. And then you took that and mailed it back to, to Kodak in um, Rochester, New York. They processed the film and then sent you back your, your pictures with another camera loaded and ready to go. <coughs> Excuse me. This is basically what a camera is. Um, it emulates a, the eye. You see uh, an image um, which is projecting light um, towards a lens. The lens is, I mean, the uh, image is then inverted. Um, and in the case of the eyeball, it lands on the retina. And in the case of, of the camera, it lands on the film or the um, uh, digital sensor um, at the back of it. This is a more complex view of it. Um, it's basically what happens to the light as it travels through the camera um, of a, a, a basic um, DSLR. And here we have sort of a range of, uh, uh, of cameras that are available. The one on the uh, left, a Holga, is basically a, a plastic camera with a plastic lens. And most of the working parts and all the optics are plastic. And it costs about 40 bucks. Um, the camera on the right is a medium format phase one. Um, and just to give you an idea of the range, the, the Holga... Um, oh, and by the way, the, the one on the uh, right is a 50 megapixel camera. Um, the one on the left goes for about $40. The one on the right, <clears throat> excuse me, goes for about $40,000. And th that's not a verbal typo on my part. That, in fact, is the range of pricing. Um, what we're talking about is uh, basically the camera obscura, uh, which existed centuries before the first photographs were actually um, created. Uh, basically, a camera obscura was a uh, small room with a hole in, um, uh, cut in one um, side of it that would project whatever scene it was facing. Um, the artist would go into this room, um, completely closed off except for that small opening, and he would use the projected image of the scene that the hole was facing um, and trace it, um, thereby capturing all of the detail um, and also the perspective um, that was required um, of, the, of the artist um, in making the final um, image. Since that time, um, there are photographers who experimented with the um, uh, camera obscura uh, best known lately has been um, a Cuban-American photographer named um, Abelardo Morel. And um, in this case, we see an image that was made in a hotel room um, that faced the um, Brooklyn Bridge. And what Morel does is he goes into the room, seals off all of the windows, cuts a very small hole um, in which he can place a... Um, some kind of optical device, which then projects into the space, and he can either um, have it right side up or, or inverted so that the, um, the projected image is upside down. And then he photographs that, um, the projection into the room, as well as the objects in the room. So you get this um, layering of information. You get the projection, you also get what's actually in the space. Now, today's technology has um, allowed photographers to really kind of run wild um, with what they can do, uh, especially in Photoshop, and um, with, I think, mixed results. Um, in this case, uh, this photograph by um, Stephen Wilkes um, is part of a series that he created several years ago in which he shows um, the same scene at night and during the day with kind of a blend of information um, somewhere in, in between, um, theoretically, um, a seamless blending. I'm not so sure about the seamless part, but um, that's the objective. On the other hand, um, this image that was taken not too um, long before that uh, Wilkes image 
this one by Andrew Moore, um, shows us Times Square, the, the same location, um, in a single image taken in a, an instant, um, which for me is just as compelling, if not more so, than the one that's heavily manipulated. And if we go back a little bit further in, in history and we look at this Lee Friedlander, also taken in Times Square, but in the mid-70s, and um, it has the same kind of kinetic energy as the, the Andrew Moore has, um, or even the Stephen Wilkes, um, but it's all uh, provided, <clears throat> excuse me, by uh, Friedlander's very um, specific and knowing uh, framing of the, the scene of Central of, um, excuse me, Times Square. Also taken in Times Square, this is um, a rather well-known photograph made by Dennis Stock of um, the actor James Dean. And um, the image on the left is the one that would end up in Life magazine and, and also being reproduced um, many other places. What we see on the right, however, um, is the a, a an initial test print um, that the printer made for stock um, in which the two of them discussed um, how uh, the final image should look um, with notations showing where um, areas should be burned in or dodged out depending on, on taste and in order to create the final mood of the final image. All images are manipulated. <clears throat> 